From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Wines. The $95 billion foreign aid package with money for Ukraine and Israel is on track to pass the House this weekend as Democrats provide the votes to pass an important procedural hurdle today. The yeas are 316, the nays are 94, the resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Democrats may need to help save Speaker Mike Johnson as well, with another Republican signing on to a motion to vacate. We'll have more with Democratic Congressman Ami Barra of California. The progress on aid for U.S. allies coming against the backdrop of, his, of a retaliatory but limited Israeli attack on Iran. We'll get reaction from former National Security Council official Michael Allen. And the full panel of jurors and alternates selected today in Donald Trump's New York hush money trial, setting the stage for opening statements as soon as next week. Our political panel will be with us today to assess the implications for his campaign and Kaylee to assess what happened today on Capitol Hill. Pretty remarkable to see these spending bills, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, which have been on ice for months, actually clear a rules vote to set up real action potentially tomorrow. Looks like these are going to pass. Yeah, that is the expectation. Of course, we'll see four votes in succession when the votes do indeed kick off. But you're right, Joe. It's probably going to require a lot of Democrats to get things over the finish line, yeah. as it did today, just to get this procedural vote through. We heard from the House Speaker Mike Johnson on this, basically saying, guys, this is the best I can do under these circumstances. It's not the legislation that we, were, we would write if Republicans were in charge of both the House and the Senate and the White House. This is the best possible product that we can get under these circumstances uh, to take care of these really important obligations. And so We're joined now by Kate Ackley of Bloomberg Government, who's been watching this for months along with the rest of us. Kate, it's great to have you. 316 to 94 was the vote for this rule, which gives us a sense of what the real vote on the underlying bill might look like. 165 Democrats were required to reach that level, more Democrats than Republicans. Is this a problem for Mike Johnson or not? Well, we're seeing bipartisanship, right? We haven't, yeah. we've done sin these, in Washington. <laughs> these long stretches and now we're seeing, uh, we're seeing some real bipartisan cooperation on this. Um, but, you know, you were asking about what happens to Speaker Johnson and I think yeah. we've been asking that question ever since he got put in that, <laughs> ever since he got his gavel. Sure. And I, I think the best way to look at it is he's somebody who is literally living on the edge, right? Mm -hmm. He's going, you know, day by day, maybe hour by hour. We'll see more what might happen over the weekend. So he doesn't know the answer to this. Will question. Democrats rescue him? I, I don't know if he knows, you know, he certainly, Republicans, I, I talked to some Republican fundraisers um, this week and said, you know, is Johnson going to have trouble raising money with this threat hanging over him if he does survive? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, he's probably OK if he stays in this in this chair until uh, the elections. But if somebody comes in next, it's just going to be a free for all. And how does a party sort of get itself, the Republican Party, how does it sort of get itself together and make a pitch mm -hmm. for keeping control of the House in the November elections? Well, certainly when it really right now is just a small number of House Republicans who seem interested in kicking Johnson out of the job. Certainly the House Intelligence Committee chair, Mike Turner, doesn't seem to want that to happen. We talked to him yesterday about the fate of Speaker Johnson, and this is what he told us. Speaker Johnson is being incredibly courageous, and you've heard him, and as you were reporting, he is saying he's doing the right thing, and uh, certainly he should be rewarded for doing the right thing. Bringing this bill uh, to the to the floor so that we can pass this on to the Senate and uh, send it to the president's desk is essential for our national security. Kate, obviously Marjorie Taylor Greene might disagree about what the right thing is. In this instance, she does seem to think the speaker is doing all of the wrong things. Can you just remind us procedurally what will happen if she decides after the Ukraine aid vote, for example, to act on the motion to vacate? How soon could we actually be dealing with members having to cast votes to decide Johnson's fate? Well, it could be soon. First of all, Johnson could decide to bring it up to you know a vote to table the motion. 
in which case that's where we could see Democrats, which they didn't do for Kevin McCarthy when he was Speaker. They did not vote to table the motion, which essentially yep. ignores it. So that would be the first thing. And if, if enough Democrats and Republicans vote to table that motion, then it goes away for right then. And then, you know, if they don't, um, then it sets in motion the same thing that we saw with Kevin McCarthy back in October, where he ultimately lost his job. It's also worth noting it would stop all business on the floor, right? So everything we're talking about here, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, would go on hold again while they had to manage that over the course of two legislative days, right? We've got three Republicans on this now, and we still don't know if they're going to make this a privileged resolution. We'll be watching tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now you've got Paul Gosar, to your point, That's Joe, right. mm -hmm. alongside Tom Massey and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, of course, already had made this threat. Kat, Kate Ackley of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much, as always, for your wonderful coverage of Congress. Now we want to turn to our other top story, Israel's apparent strike inside Iran overnight. Secretary of State Antony Blinken did not directly confirm that attack while speaking today at the G7 foreign ministers meeting in Italy, but he did have this to say. The United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions, um, to de-escalate from any potential conflict. Uh, you saw Israel on the receiving end of an unprecedented attack, um, but our focus has been on, of course, making sure that Israel can effectively defend itself, but also de-escalating tensions, uh, avoiding uh, conflict, uh, and that remains our focus. Let's go now to Bloomberg's Greg White. So, Greg, as we hear the Secretary of State talking about de-escalating tensions, is it the prevailing thinking now in Washington that actually this strike was more de-escalatory than escalatory because Israel could have gone a lot further than it did? Absolutely. So far, when you look at the situation, if you think back to a week ago, we were anticipating uh, Iran's retaliation on, on Israel, and there was great fear that this was going to be a new spiral of you know, direct strikes from Iran on Israel, something we'd never seen before in the decades of the, the shadow war between these countries. Yeah. And through a series of dangerous but seemingly choreographed actions, things have so far, at least, managed to be oh, contained. So you had the Israeli strike, the oh, over the or the the Iranian strike over the weekend, uh, which Israel and its allies were able to oh, largely neutralize, and then this strike that Israel hasn't claimed responsibility for, but uh, seems pretty clear uh, where it came from. D doesn't seem to have done too much damage inside Iran, but sent the message that uh, well, if you're going to fire at us from your territory, we have the ability to do that to you. So mm -hmm. I think the question there, there's very cautious oh. oh hope here that at least this episode has been contained. They also proved a point, though, didn't they? W without causing much damage, that they could strike deep inside Iran, in this case an area that is home to Iran's nuclear facilities and a couple of military bases, without being intercepted the way Iran was when it attacked Israel. Did it say more with what it did here than it might have with a more pronounced strike? Well, certainly, I think the Israelis wanted to send a signal with this that, uh -huh. that, 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 as you say, that they, they could they could evade the defenses and that there, that that uh, if they really wanted to strike, they could do something substantially yeah. bigger. Similarly, the, the Iran was trying to send a message too that that we're not deterred by this; mm -hmm. we're ready to take these risks. Uh, so the next, there's no guarantee that the next time this kind of thing happens, it will be as easily contained. Right. Uh, it, it's certainly been a, a, a very stressful week of, of diplomacy on all sides to try to to, to, to keep this uh, li as limited as it was uh, with, uh, in, in the circumstances. Well, we spent all week waiting for the strike. Now we know it at least this stage looks like, I guess, Kaylee, there's a chance that this could be it for now. But we'll, of course, let our listeners and viewers know. Bloomberg's Greg White, we thank you for your coverage on an important story. Coming up, California Democratic Congressman Ami Berra will be joining us to talk about all the issues that we've been discussing. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. did not do this better policy and process, allowing for amendments on the floor uh, in, in the process tomorrow, uh, we would have had to eat the Senate supplemental bill. And that is because we were very close, given the timeline in both uh, Israel and Ukraine, to a discharge petition being brought. That would have happened imminently on the Senate supplemental. 
Speaker Mike Johnson earlier today after the House advanced the aid package for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan, setting up an expected weekend vote. The Speaker relying, of course, on Democratic assistance to move it forward. More Democrats voting yes for the rule today than Republicans. And Democratic Congressman Ami Berra joins us now, the congressman from California. It's good to see you, sir. Welcome back to Bloomberg. It strikes me what happened in the Rules Committee last night and on the floor today with the actual vote on the rule to advance this legislation is significant. Is this the start of a coalition government in the House? Yeah, I certainly hope so. I mean, you hear from constituents all the time that they want more bipartisanship. They want folks to work together. And you just saw um, the majority of the House, Democrats and Republicans, come together to pass something that is fundamentally important to global security. Um, so advancing this rule with Democratic and Republican votes shouldn't be the anomaly. Maybe that should be the norm. Well, there also is the question, sir, of whether or not everyone would like to see this become the norm. Certainly, there are members of the Republican conference who aren't in agreement that Mike Johnson should be working in a bipartisan member uh, in a bipartisan manner with Democrats, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, Tom Massey and Paul Gosar can be added to that list. And it raises the question of whether you and your colleagues might be put in the position where you have to make a decision whether or not to save a Republican speaker. We talked about this with your colleague, Congressman Adam Smith, earlier this week, and this is what he told us. We'll have you respond. I, for one, will not vote to remove uh, Speaker Johnson. And I know a number of other Democrats feel the same way that I do. There's kind of this coy little thing back and forth as to whether or not we say that publicly. I tend to be more blunt and straightforward than most members, so I'm not going to be coy about it. Sir, are you uh, among uh, that number of other Democrats who agree with Congressman Smith? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate Adam Smith's bluntness. Um, yeah, thus far, we've seen Speaker Johnson's willingness to work across the aisle in a bipartisan way. That's what the country wants. Um, and as long as he's willing to work in a bipartisan way, why wouldn't we protect him? Um, obviously, I'd love to see Speaker Hakeem Jeffries. That's probably not going to happen. So short of that, I'd like a Republican speaker that's willing to work with us and do the, the, huh. the will of the country. Well, the answer to why wouldn't we is because we want to take the House as a Democrat, right, Congressman? The, the potential fallout here from a failure of a Republican majority would play in the favor of your party in November, would it not? Yeah, but aren't, aren't we all tired of politics? Like, we are the United States of America. We have a war that's raging in Europe. We need to protect the Ukrainian people and stop this tyrant and Vladimir Putin. We have to contain a war in the Middle East and try to find some end to this in a ceasefire. We have to provide humanitarian aid around this world, and we want to prevent a war in Asia. So I don't. We're not elected to play politics. We're elected to lead. And you know what? Thus far, Speaker Johnson has been leading. And if he needs Democratic votes um, to continue leading and working with us in a bipartisan way, why wouldn't we do that? Well. Congressman, of course, you're speaking of a number of active conflicts around the world, including in the Middle East. And as you suggest that there is a need for a ceasefire, I wonder, especially given your seat on the Foreign Affairs and Intelligence Committees, if you think what we have seen transpire over the last week, the Iranian unprecedented attack from Iranian territory into Israeli airspace, Israel striking back overnight, even in a limited manner, are you concerned that that degree of escalation we have seen makes a ceasefire further out of reach? I think we're all very concerned at watching what happened last weekend. And then, you know, certainly a lot of us were up last night texting with one another and, and getting information about um, what happened in Iran yesterday. Again, my hope, I think we've seen um, reassuring might be too strong a word, but appropriate comments out of Israel as well as Iran. And maybe this is de escalatory. And, you know, our negotiators, Director Burns, Secretary Blinken, um, can now take this as an opportunity to, to ratchet um, things down and look for a path forward for a ceasefire. Because what I really do worry about are the number of folks that are on the verge of starvation. We've got to get that humanitarian aid in there and then look for a longer term path forward. Well, I do wonder uh, on your two committees that Kaylee mentioned what you're hearing today, Congressman, do you think that response was proportionate? Um, I 
think we're in in a good place where um, you now may be able to open up a broader dialogue to um, not escalate this, but actually to start de-escalating this. I think yeah, you know, there's an opportunity perhaps to to find a ceasefire, perhaps to get the Saudis involved here. I mean, there this is a very difficult negotiation. Uh, as Sec as Director Burns said, Hamas has to agree to a ceasefire, and thus far they really have been the, the, the barriers to getting to a ceasefire. Sir, of course, the conflict between Israel and Hamas, or just Israel as an ally, is not the only thing that this package will address, assuming that it is indeed passed on the House floor tomorrow. It also will provide over $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. There is a question of how quickly this will be able to move through the Senate and therefore get a signature from President Biden after that. Is it too late already to make a difference in this conflict between Ukraine and Russia? Does it make Ukraine actually more likely to win, or does it just help them continue to maintain the status quo? No, this aid is absolutely necessary. It, you know, I wish we had gotten this aid to, to Ukraine a few months ago, four months ago, but it is absolutely crucial um, after we pass this vote and send it over to the Senate that they take care of it, send it to the president's desk, and that we get the necessary aid, munitions, humanitarian supplies to Ukraine as fast as possible. Um, the war is at a critical phase, and you know, you've heard Director Burns talk about this. Um, we've been briefed on it both in Foreign Affairs and the Intel Committee. It is time for us to you know, uh, support the Ukrainian people who are fighting admirably in this war. Um, let's get it to a place where I think Vladimir Putin realizes that he ought to come to the negotiating table. And then let's try to figure out how to end this conflict. Ending the conflict uh, is quite a thought at this point, Congressman, as we consider the long term. How important is it for Democrats and more specifically for Joe Biden to have both of these conclude by the time voters go to the polls in November? You know, I think the president has been doing everything he can to hold a coalition together to end a war in Europe. He is, has been very decisive in his decision making in moving assets to the Middle East to contain a war. Um, you see Secretary Blinken, you see Director Burns just working overtime. And I'm empathetic to how much they're traveling these days to really try to find a negotiated ceasefire, which can create space to get humanitarian aid into Gaza, but also can try to find a more permanent solution to stabilize the Middle East. Um, you know, I think it's important for us to do this, but I hope the public recognizes what President Biden has already done. All right. Democratic Congressman Ami Barra of California, thank you so much for joining us this evening, sir. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Coming up next, French Minister of Development Chrysoula Zakharopoulou will be here with us on set in Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. As the IMF wraps up its meeting here in Washington, there are some calls to reform the international financial system. The Paris Pact for People and the Planet, 4P, brings together dozens of countries that are working together in that effort. And for more, we're joined now here on set by the French Minister of Development, Chrysoula Zakharoupoulou. Minister, thank you so much for being with us. When we talk about reforming the international financial system, that seems quite... Uh, broad and potentially a daunting task. What specifically do you see that isn't working that you would like to focus on, that you would like to reform? Yes, uh, it, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, a huge question. <laughs> and actually, when we speak about reforming uh, the international financing system means many things. That's why we realized that uh, we have to do something, and it was born the Paris Pact for People and the Planet. That means, uh, listen, we uh, need four trillion uh, dollars uh, if we want to respect the SDGs. 
that means that all people can live uh, uh, in our planet, you know, with dignity. And uh, we have only 200 billion. That means that we have a huge ga gap. So we have to have the courage now to reform uh, the multilateral uh, development banks. We have to treat uh, uh, the debt, the question of uh, the debt, because many countries, particularly in Africa, they have uh, problems with the debt. And uh, what happened, if I can say in Paris, it is that uh, we were all together uh, from, you know, north, south, east, west, uh, NGOs, uh, um, head of states, and we say, let's accelerate. Let's accelerate means uh, what we have to do. Uh, reallocate SDRs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, we achieve to have more than a hundred billion of dollars. Uh, um, we uh, want a better and bigger uh, bank. That's what we try to do, for example, with the World Bank, and we see the results. Uh, we um, spoke about the debt restructuration. So there are many positive things, but of course. Uh, we have uh, a lot of things to do together. Yeah. You've been in Washington uh, all this week yeah. making this case. How receptive has the U.S. been to these ideas? Uh, we, you know, we are together uh, uh, with uh, the United States. Of course, we have different systems mm -hmm. uh, because of the Congress. In Europe, the system is a little bit different. Yeah. But we have the same vision, okay. you know, uh, and uh, I think that... Uh, we work uh, very well together. And what about Kristalina Georgieva, for example? The actual institutions holding the meetings this week, the IMF, the World Bank, yes. they are with you in this effort. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I know uh, very well Kristalina. Uh, she's doing a very good job. Uh, she helped all the countries in difficulty. Uh, that's why I spoke about uh, the question of restructuration of debt. Mm -hmm. We, all of us, uh, uh, the common framework, uh, uh, as you know, um, we work all together for the question of uh, the debt of uh, Zambia. That is yes. uh, an example where the role of Kristalina of, uh, was, uh, was crucial. I know you just came from seeing the Olympic flame yes. in Greece. You're hosting the Olympics in Paris this year. Safe travels home. We'd like to talk to you again about what that will mean for your economy as well. Thanks for joining us today thank in you. Washington. French Minister of Development, Chrysula Zakharopoulou. We thank you for being with us today on Bloomberg. Coming up, former National Security Council member Michael Allen joins us as we discuss tensions in the Middle East between Israel and Iran. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. On Ukraine, most important thing is getting this aid voted and moving it forward. And it will, um, I know, make a profound difference and make a profound difference almost right away in making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself effectively against the ongoing Russian aggression. No. Is it too late? No. If it happens now, uh, it's not too late. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the G7 ministers meeting in Italy earlier today. The message, it's not too late. Many have suggested it is. For more on this, we bring in Michael Allen, managing director and partner at Beacon Global Strategies, former official at the National Security Council in the Bush administration. Michael, it's great to see you again. Thanks for being with us. There's a lot I'd love to ask you about because we've been talking about this run up for a couple of months now with you. And it is apparently coming together in the House much the same way it did in the Senate. If we can start with Ukraine, the administration told us the window was closing at the end of last year. How much opportunity do we have to change the course with this bill? I think it's the assistance is going to get there just in time. As you can see from all the reports coming out of Ukraine, the Russians have begun to make progress again. Mm -hmm. They have won battles and taken over villages in eastern Ukraine. Their wartime economy is geared back up. Their army is now bigger than it was at the beginning of the war. So the Russians are gearing up for a longer campaign, and we're stepping in just in the nick of time. And Europe is stepping up just in the nick of time to bolster Ukraine and hopefully to make this into a fairer fight. Mm. 
But I guess the question I've been asking is, are we coming up in the nick of time to allow Ukraine to hold the line, essentially, or to allow Ukraine to actually make advances against Russia? Because there is a difference there, sir, I would think. I think so. I think this is going to boost Ukraine's morale, which honestly has been a little bit low of late. They so still have psychological the, as well. I think there will be an immediate psychological benefit that the United States is back, that we're back in their corner and that we're writing checks on their behalf. And I think that will in turn help with the equipment in the medium term, like weeks and months. I think this is going to be of assistance. I still think the long-term dynamics favor Ukraine making more progress and pushing Russia back, but they've got to get geared up. They have been retooling for this very effort. I think there'll have to be more NATO training. But, you know, your viewers should know, as I think you do, that this is going to go on for years. It's not going to be an over and done with campaign anytime soon. We spoke earlier today with Valdis Dombrovskis, European commissioner for uh, a trader about aid for Ukraine. Here's what he told us. I very much uh, look forward for tomorrow's uh, uh, votes, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully uh, this Ukraine uh, support is um, uh, being uh, up approved, because uh, what we see is that uh, in the last months, uh, actually, the situation in Ukraine is uh, deteriorating uh, for uh, for the lack, uh, especially, of uh, military uh, support. We yeah. see it both at the front line, and we see it with the uh, daily uh, shellings of uh, Ukrainian uh, cities, uh, residential areas, uh, critical infrastructure. So this support is uh, very much uh, needed. Executive Vice President uh, as well for the commission speaking with us here on Balance of Power. Michael, what is the message that we're sending to our European allies here? Because we're at the same time in many cases asking them to do more. I think this helps us make the case that we need to do more. After all, Populism here in the United States, probably driven in part by Trump, or maybe Trump's a phenomenon of populism, is all about step up, do your part, make sure that we are supporting our allies and that they are supporting us. Europe has been, that's sort of been an underwritten story here of late, that Europe has stepped up now more than ever. So I really think this helps us put back in the game get back in the game and gives us the moral authority once again to go to others around the world and say the United States has anteed up. Now you have to do so because we have to get ready for the longer revitalization of the U.S. defense industrial base. Yeah. We've got to be able to restore deterrence in Asia so China in three years doesn't go after Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, another theater to pay attention to, which is why in this aid package that we do expect could have passed the House this weekend, it is not just aid for Israel, aid for Ukraine. It is also aid for uh, the Indo-Pacific, specifically Taiwan. But on the Israel point, we also need to acknowledge the developments overnight. Of course, we were expecting an Israeli response to the barrage of more than 300 drones and missiles Iran sent last weekend. It seems like what we got in return was quite limited, a drone strike on, yes, a military facility, but it did not seem to cause much damage. The nuclear capabilities were not touched. Was that de-escalatory more so than escalatory? And if it was de-escalatory, is it all de-escalation from here? So I think over time we're going to view the Israeli retaliation last night as de-escalatory. It's hard to call it that here on the, the day after, but I think over time, looking back at it, we're going to view it in just that way. I think for now, the Biden administration and others have successfully sort of managed this escalation stop spiral back downward, but it's still a powder keg in the, in, in, over in the Middle East. I think the Israelis, when they reflect on what's happened to them of late, first October 7th, and second, Iran actually sending ballistic missiles and drones into Israel, I think they're going to once again think we need to reset the security environment in the Middle East. We can't live with a genocidal terrorist organization like Hezbollah on our northern border. I don't think they'll do this immediately. I think they're going to go back to Gaza first. But I don't think they're going to just sort of leave this era in history with Hezbollah sitting there. I want to ask you about Afghanistan while you're with us. We had a conversation uh, with General Ken McKenzie this week, who, of course, helped to oversee as leader of CENTCOM at the time the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And the findings of the government's investigation and his testimony, along with that, which we heard from Mark Milley, uh, makes us wonder the extent to which this could be an issue on the campaign trail. Republicans have criticized Joe Biden extensively for the, the Marines who died there. General McKenzie 
weighed in uh, on the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Here's what he said. I think my opinion at the time was leaving, uh, leaving completely was a mistake. Uh, and, and I've been pretty open about that ever since. My views were heard. A, a, a president made a decision, and he is actually a decision maker. He gets to make that call. Mm -hmm. And uh, my opinion then and my opinion now remains the same. We would have been wiser to keep a small residual force in Afghanistan. And, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I stand by that today. We don't need to litigate the issue here, but to what extent will Republicans make it one on the campaign? I think it's definitely a campaign issue. I don't think also that they're doing it for purely partisan reasons. I think there are legitimate concerns up there. After President Bush, President Obama, and others asked these men and women of the United States Army and Marines and elsewhere to dedicate a portion of their lives to try and not only successfully prosecute a counterterrorism mission, but also to try and bring some peace and order to stability, instability to, an Afghani to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And what happened was is that we got out abruptly. The way we got ab out abruptly helped with the collapse and the success of the Taliban's offensive into, into Kabul. So I think the circumstances and the way we got out of this are very much, you know, as they say, sort of something that should be debated on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. Well, the two people that are campaigning, primarily the presumptive Republican nominee and Democratic nominee, are, yes, Joe Biden, but also Donald Trump, who is the one who initially made the commitment with the Taliban to pull out of Afghanistan. So is, is the proper punishment entirely inflicted on the administration that actually had to execute or the one before it that set the stage for it to happen? I definitely think that Donald Trump should have to answer for the plans that they had levied at the time. He didn't go through with them. Um, I. But I don't think he should escape criticism or scrutiny for it. But the actual huge event was definitely withdrawal, and not just withdrawal, the precipitous overnight withdrawal, especially from Bagram Air Base, that really left the Afghanistan National Army in a sense that they had been abandoned. That caused them to really just put down their arms and uniforms and go back into society. And that basically invited the Taliban to come in hurriedly. So. We're going to have to look at this, by the way, just like COVID, just like uh, Iraq, just Afghanistan, these things we're going to have to examine over time in a depoliticized format mm. to try and figure out the lessons learned for the United States. All right. Well, it's always great to have you examining with us, Michael Allen, of course, former national security official under the George W. Bush administration. Thank we you. appreciate your time is now with Beacon Strategies. Now, coming up, those foreign aid bills we were just talking about do seem on pass to help on on track to pass. It's Friday with Democratic help this weekend. I don't have to work tomorrow. Congress does. We'll have more with Rick and Jeannie coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Because we did this process, we got a better outcome here. We have uh, a lot of innovations that the Senate did not consider. We include the Repo Act, which, as you know, is the use of uh, corrupt Russian oligarchs' assets to help fund the resistance in Ukraine. We introduced the loan concept for the, the governmental assistance part. It would be provided in a loan instead of a, a gift. Uh, we also included some really important sanctions on Russia and China and Iran. House Speaker Mike Johnson earlier today after the House made it over a procedural hurdle on the $95 billion foreign aid package, needing Democrats to get it done and setting the stage for final passage this weekend. Our closers are with us now, Rick Davis of Stonecourt Capital and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Rick, a lot of people are celebrating this as a win today. Foreign aid seems like it finally is going to pass Congress. But I feel like we need to take stock of the fact that this is $95 billion dollars pretty darn similar to what the Senate had already passed weeks ago, <laughs> and not that far out of line from what President Biden requested in his supplemental request months ago. So what was it all worth if this was where we ultimately were going to end up and all that happened was it delayed these, this aid getting to our allies? Yeah, and I think you uh, left out the most important fact, which is the Senate actually put a significant border security provision yep. onto all this mm -hmm. so that we could actually get control of our southern border. And that vanished in the process. So the one thing that nobody has been able to do for 30 years was going to get done. 
And nothing is different in the House bill versus the Senate bill other than the few things that the speaker just mentioned, which are minor at best. So uh, we missed an opportunity in history to actually do something significant. This is pretty remarkable. Uh, <laughs> Tom Massey, who has signed on to the motion to vacate one of three, uh, sent out a tweet after this, or an X. He says, the U.S. House is now officially in an alternate universe where the speaker shares procedural power with Democrats. This followed the Rules Committee vote last night in which Democrats, which was significant if you follow parliamentary procedure here, had to save the speaker's plan. We spoke earlier today with former White House Chief of Staff, Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney. He's a co-founder of the Freedom Caucus uh, about his take on this. Here's what he said. This is a coalition government. That, that's exactly what this is right now. You have to rely on the Democrats. Then you are now in a coalition government. You're now passing stuff that is acceptable to a majority of both Republicans and Democrats, a coalition style government. Jeannie, is that what you would call this? I know it hasn't been formalized, but does it matter? Yeah, I mean, the, the word coalition, I've never heard it so much as in the last 24, 48 hours. That's for sure. Yeah, it is It is an apt description of what is going on. But of course, it's what has to go on when you have a one seat majority as of today. And of course, a lot of dissension on both sides, quite frankly, but particularly in the majority side. So this is what they had to do to get this thing through. And, you know, I think what's so maddening to people is not only is this bill not that much different than what the Senate passed, except, as Rick mentioned, because of the border issue. But the idea that they're deconstructing it, going to go to votes on Saturday, and then construct it back together and haul it over to the Senate. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, what's the point of that? And of course, the <laughs> point is giving people the option to vote on certain parts and not the others. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's the only way we can get things done. And, you know, certainly for one thing, this has to get done. Well, there's the question of the cost of getting it done, though, for Speaker Mike Johnson is the aforementioned Tom Massey that Joe was referring to, together with Paul Gosar now, are all on board with Marjorie Taylor Greene's effort, apparently, to try to oust the Speaker. Potentially, we're waiting for that. Could happen this weekend. And then it becomes a question, Jeannie, of what the Democrats will do. We asked one of them, the congressman from California, Ami Barra, about that just earlier this hour. And this is what he told us. Aren't we all tired of politics? Like, we are the United States of America. We have a war that's raging in Europe. We need to protect the Ukrainian people and stop this tyrant in Vladimir Putin. We have to contain a war in the Middle East and try to find some end to this in a ceasefire. We have to provide humanitarian aid around this world. And we want to prevent a war in Asia. So I don't, we're not elected to play politics. We're elected to lead. And you know what? Thus far, Speaker Johnson has been leading. And if he needs Democratic votes um, to continue leading and working with us in a bipartisan way, why wouldn't we do that? And Jeannie, Joe asked him, well, isn't the reason why you wouldn't do that because you want to maintain the House or you want to flip the House rather Democratic in November? Is this going to backfire on Democrats if they do this? You know, I, I hope not. You know, I think it, what he says is really important. I mean, there's so much that needs to be done. And I think Democrats have to look at their constituents just like Republicans when they go to the ballot box and they have to be able to say that they achieved something and they weren't only thinking about their election and elect re-election, but they were also thinking about the good of the country and the good of the district. So I think it's very important. Um, and I think Democrats are going to, and we've already heard from several who have said that they are going to support the speaker on this, not because they're supporting the speaker, but because they see what needs to be done. And in this case, it's aid for three really important areas of the world that without which, you know, the impact on all of us is very detrimental. Well, Chris, we've got the sidecar also, Rick. We don't want to leave that out because you and I have talked a lot about blocking the talk over the past year, actually. This has come and gone a few times. This looks like it's actually going to happen here. If you're going to vote no on TikTok, that means voting no on Israel and Ukraine. So I would ask you as a professional uh, investor here at Stone Court, you know what it's like to be in the acquisitions business. This goes from six months to a year to divest. Is that enough? Yeah, well, it may be enough, right? And there may need to be more legislation to extend that if there's a deal in the works that 
can't get closed by that time, but mm-hmm. is a uh, certainly something that the, the United States would benefit from. And, 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 and look, I think this is really going to be a gut check for the Senate because you can't amend this package. Part of the design right. of putting it all back together again is you lock it up. Mm-hmm. No amendments out of the Senate. You've got to pick it for everything it's got in it. And so um, even though we have a lot of senators who have been talking about blocking the talk, uh, <laughs> the question is going to be, are they prepared to walk that? And uh, you may lose a couple of members because of that provision. But the reality is a deal could get done. Uh, it's a massive transaction, uh, tens of billions of dollars yeah. that will be needed to do this. But look at China has got a gun to their head now, right? You either shut it down or sell it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, that is a very good place to be if you're an investor interested in owning TikTok. How about that? <laughs> Rick and Jeannie are going to stay with us. Our signature panel with more ahead. The full fury selected. The full jury, rather, selected. <laughs> we'll talk about the fury as well coming up. <laughs> in the first criminal trial of an American president, or at least a former one in this case, apparently set to happen next week. The Fire and the Fury next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is a case that was put in very strongly because of politics. So instead of being in Pennsylvania or Georgia or... North Carolina or lots of other places today. I'm sitting in a courthouse all day long. This is going on for the week, and this will go on for another four or five weeks, and it's very unfair. And people know, and people know it's very unfair. The former president, Donald Trump, outside the courthouse this morning as the jury is selected. For more, we're back with our political panel, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano. Rick, that's been the refrain from Donald Trump in his first week in court. He's been actually pretty consistent with the message. Hey, I could be in this state or that one. But the fact of the matter is, can we acknowledge he wasn't going to most of those states already anyway? Is this actually changing his routine? Yeah, this is the classic have your cake and eat it to Donald Trump, right? Yeah. He hasn't been traveling, as you point out, very much once every you know 10 days to go to a right. state. And, uh, and now he's using this platform uh, to uh, complain about being stuck in the courts. By the way, he attended more court sessions that were elective for him Isn't that right? than he's actually spent time in this court case. So, uh, you know, look, it's Donald Trump. You can't pay attention to him when his lips start moving because you're going to find that he's telling a lie. Uh, I will be interested, though, in what kind of case they present next week because mm-hmm. Is it what Donald Trump has been saying all along, which is he's being prosecuted by the government? You know, this is all mission creep. Or are they going to actually get into the merits of the case? Yeah. I, I think it's more politics than it is legal on his side. Well, and the case may involve tales of not just one, but two alleged extramarital affairs. Jeannie, to this point, Donald Trump has been able to fundraise off his legal problems quite effectively. Does that stop when it's these kind of tales being told? Yeah, I I don't think we know. So far, it has been effective for him. But I do think there is a difference. You know, Monday morning or whenever we have opening statements, which will be sometime on Monday, according to the judge, um, you know, this is a whole new world for all of us, a president and a presidential candidate sitting in a criminal trial. I mean, it is the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump. And he's got to sit through every grueling moment. And of course, there has been chaos. And you know this better than anybody, Kayla you were out there for hours outside the courtroom. I'm in Manhattan now. Earlier in the day, a young man lit himself on fire and is now apparently in the, you know, in intensive care. So there's been chaos outside, chaos inside. I'm sure difficulty for Donald Trump hearing all of this. The Sandoval hearing he Mm -hmm. had to sit through this afternoon. Very difficult to listen to all the potential bad acts you've committed that could come up if you decide to testify. So we're in a brand new world. I don't know if he's going to be able to continue fundraising off of this. But we do know that they are going to give it their best shot. Of course, he goes to North Carolina and then we're hearing about something in New Jersey. Um, So he's going to give it his shot and try to keep going if he can. 
All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, our closers, as always, thank you so much. Of course, Joe, there's still a lot we don't know about that incident outside the court today. What, if yep. anything, it had to do with Trump's case, but certainly capturing uh, a lot of our attention, just given the heightened scrutiny around it. Of course, we'll continue to have that covered for you here on this program and in the Washington Edition newsletter. You can find that on the terminal and online. Yeah, stay with us on the terminal and online with breaking news expected throughout the weekend. And we'll distill it all together on Monday here on Balance of Power. Have a great weekend. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio.